Tech giant Intel is apologizing to China after backlash from Chinese shoppers at issue. The company's statement about avoiding forced labor in Xinjiang. The first day of lockdowns in Xi'an, the harshest in China so far. Life in the mega city seems to have stopped, except for the long queue of people waiting for virus tests in the snow. The Chinese foreign ministry says that Lithuania will be swept into the trash can of history. A Lithuanian lawmaker responds by saying communism is already in the trash can. A new Hong Kong government-backed study finds that three doses of the Chinese Sinovac vaccine is not effective at protecting against the Omicron variant. Most of China is vaccinated with Chinese vaccines, and a leading Hong Kong university has dismantled and removed a famous statue from its campus, one that commemorates the victims of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Tech giant Intel is in hot water in China. The company is receiving backlash over a statement about forced labor in the Xinjiang region. NTD's Juliet Song reports. An apology from U.S. tech giant Intel is going viral on the Chinese internet. A related hashtag has attracted over 300 million views and over 100,000 discussions. Intel apologized for making statements regarding forced labor in China. In a letter, the company told its suppliers to not source goods from China's Xinjiang region, citing concerns of forced labor there. Xinjiang is located in northwestern China. It's home to 12 million Uyghurs, a predominantly Muslim ethnic minority. Washington says Beijing is committing genocide against them through slave labor, mass detention, and forced sterilization. Beijing denies rights abuses in Xinjiang. Inside China, Intel's letter sparked massive controversy. A Communist Party tabloid says Intel bites the hand that feeds it. China is one of Intel's largest markets. The company made a quarter of its sales there last year, over 20 billion dollars. Following the backlash, the company published an apology on Chinese social media platform Weibo. It says, although our original intention was to ensure compliance with U.S. laws. This letter has caused many questions and concerns among our cherished Chinese partners, which we deeply regret. But for some Chinese internet users, the apology is not enough. One internet user says, "Why should China do business with you since you're so insincere?" Another left a comment saying, "Then don't come to China to do business. Just go observe the law in the U.S." It's unclear if the Chinese internet users are aware of the rights abuses in Xinjiang. Related topics are heavily censored on the Chinese internet, and when Western companies speak out about them, Chinese state-controlled media fans nationalist anger against those companies. And Intel is not the first company that came under pressure after crossing Beijing's red line. Brands like H&M met with boycotts after expressing concerns about forced labor in Xinjiang. Adidas ran into a similar situation this year. Back in Washington, here's what the White House has to say about Intel's situation. Well, I, I can't speak to the specific situation with one company, but I can say, as a general matter, that we believe the private sector and the international community should oppose PRC, the PRC's weaponizing of its markets to stifle support for human rights. We also think that American companies should never feel the need to apologize for standing up for fundamental human rights or opposing repression. Saki goes on to say that in reality, companies that fail to address forced labor in their supply chains face serious legal risk, not just in the United States but in Europe and other regions of the world. Juliet Song, NTD News. The most consequential move so far in holding China accountable for genocide. That's how one lawmaker described a bill the president signed into law today. NTD's Iris Tao has more. It's official. President Biden on Thursday signs into law legislation that bans all imports from China's Xinjiang region. That's the latest in Washington's pushback against forced labor in the region with alleged genocide. The bill passed with unanimous support in both the House and Senate earlier this month, with a bipartisan consensus rarely seen in Congress. 
The legislation requires the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to create a list of entities involved in Beijing's suppression of its own people, including ethnic minorities. It also establishes a presumption that all goods from Xinjiang were made with forced labor. Evidence has suggested that over a million minority Muslim Uyghurs have been forced into re-education camps in Xinjiang. The region is the world's major supplier of cotton for clothing and polysilicon for solar panels. I don't know that it's a surprise. That's the White House on Thursday responding to whether the U.S. is concerned that China will be upset by Biden signing the bill. Earlier this week, Beijing has just issued another round of sanctions against U.S. officials for criticizing the Chinese regime over Xinjiang. We have made no secret of our concerns. The president has spoken to them. We worked and gathered the G7 leaders uh, to sign a statement on this um, about the human rights abuses in Xinjiang. So I don't know that it's a surprise. Congresswoman Jennifer Wexton calls the new comprehensive import ban the most consequential action Congress has taken to hold China accountable for the genocide of the Uyghurs. Beijing has denied human rights accusations and called for boycotts of foreign brands that publicly cut ties with Xinjiang products in their supply chains. Iris Tao, NTD News. A major Chinese city is just one step away from the highest level of lockdown. 13 million residents have to either stay at home or wait in line for mandatory virus tests. Much of what's happening there is similar to what happened in Wuhan nearly two years ago. Here are the details. Xi'an City in central China reported 91 new cases of the CCP virus on Thursday. And the lockdown began on the same day. Video footage shows residents lining up for virus tests in the snow. The measures come just weeks before the Beijing Winter Olympics. Authorities are following the Chinese regime's policy of driving new transmissions to zero. The sudden lockdown is causing massive disruptions to residents' daily lives. Local residents say they have a hard time getting groceries. The city is locked down and there are no supplies. The prices are soaring. It's really hard to get anything. We have to eat dry food during quarantine. There are no vegetables. I cannot go out. And besides, people don't have much money. Restrictions in Xi'an are some of the toughest since China locked down Wuhan in the beginning of the pandemic. Both are mega cities with over 10 million people. Xi'an is now only one level away from the highest category of lockdown in China, in which case residents are absolutely banned from leaving their homes. According to Chinese state media, the Xi'an airport canceled all domestic flights by Thursday morning. A Lithuanian lawmaker is trash-talking the CCP in a rather literal sense. The chairman of the Lithuanian Parliamentarian Group for Relations with Taiwan tweeted this. It reads, the Chinese Communist Party is threatening to sweep Lithuania into the trash can of history, which is ironic because that's where communism already is. The tweet is in response to a remark from the Chinese Foreign Ministry on Monday. A reporter asked Beijing to comment on the Lithuanian Agricultural Minister's potential visit to Taiwan. The Chinese Foreign Minister said that Lithuania will be swept into the trash can of history if the country colludes with Taiwan independence forces. Relations between Lithuania and China deteriorated in recent months. That's after the Baltic state allowed Taiwan to open a de facto embassy there using the name Taiwan. A fresh study by the University of Hong Kong found that three doses of China's Sinovac vaccine are ineffective against the Omicron variant. The Hong Kong government partly funds the study. Findings show that a third dose of Sinovac doesn't produce enough antibodies to protect against Omicron. The study also analyzed the effectiveness of a third dose of the Pfizer vaccine. It found the Pfizer booster generated protective levels of antibodies against the new variant. This latest study comes after a previous one by the same university. The previous study found that two doses of Sinovac didn't produce enough antibodies to defend against Omicron. The Omicron variant has already been discovered in China, and the majority of Chinese citizens have been vaccinated with either China's Sinovac or Sinopharm vaccines. 
The Chinese regime is sending a warning to celebrities. Local tax authorities in eight regions, including Beijing and Shanghai, released an ultimatum to celebrities and live streamers on Wednesday. The agencies are asking celebrities to proactively rectify their tax-related problems, saying if they fail to comply, there will be serious consequences. This comes after authorities find China's top live streamer, Bia, a record $210 million for tax evasion. The ultimatum says the deadline is the end of this year. Current affairs commentator Zhang Jiangping from China's Jiangsu province told U.S.-based outlet Radio Free Asia what he thinks. He says it doesn't seem very proper to call out potential tax evaders through a political movement. He says this is contrary to the rule of law. And are tax evaders in China going to face criminal charges? Tax authorities in Hangzhou City quotes the criminal code, saying there is the possibility. China affairs analyst Tang Jingyuan says now that the Chinese economy is not doing so well, the regime is trying to clamp down on businesses in order to make revenue. Chinese authorities previously warned for people to prepare for tough times. Tang says the regime is targeting some high-income earners in such an economic environment. A leading Hong Kong university has dismantled and removed a statue from its campus. For more than two decades, the statue has commemorated the victims of the Tiananmen Square massacre. The Danish sculptor who created the piece says he is totally shocked, and he will be claiming compensation for any damage. A famous statue commemorating the lives lost during China's Tiananmen Square crackdown has been removed from Hong Kong University. Late on Wednesday night, security guards placed yellow barricades around the 26-foot-high copper sculpture called the Pillar of Shame. The artwork is one of the few remaining public memorials in the former British colony to remember the bloody crackdown in 1989. It features anguished human torsos to represent the pro-democracy protesters killed by the Chinese authorities. The Tiananmen incident remains a taboo subject in mainland China where it cannot be publicly commemorated. I, I don't think people would expect this thing would happen in the university, so-called, with uh, the most freedom of expression or freedom of speech. And uh, they try to become the first one to remove every history or parts of history inside the campus. Several months ago, the university sent a legal letter to the custodians of the statue, asking for its removal. In a statement, HKU said that no party had ever obtained approval to display the statue on its campus. It also called the statue fragile and said it posed potential safety issues. I'm the owner of the statue. But the Danish sculptor behind the piece has hit out at the institution. Jens Galschut said in a statement he was totally shocked at the move against his private property and that he would claim compensation for any damage to the sculpture. The removal of the statue is the latest step targeting people or organizations affiliated with the sensitive June 4, 1989 date and events to market. China has moved to create a rare earth industry giant. That's by merging three of the country's leading rare earth producers into one. The Chinese regime would directly control the new company. The move could help China tighten its control over the global rare earth industry. And China is already a dominant player. It controls 80% of the global rare earth supply. Rare earth is important because it is essential for making high-tech products. For example, the U.S. needs rare earth to make laser weapons, cell phones and airplanes. But the U.S. gets 80 percent of its rare earth from China. Given the tension between the U.S. and China, there's been growing concerns over relying on China for this strategic resource. And Japan has already gotten a taste of that. In 2010, China cut off rare earth exports to Japan following a diplomatic dispute, although it lifted the ban about a month later. The U.S. is on the move to diversify its rare earth supply chain. Earlier this year, the Pentagon gave an Australian company over $30 million to build a rare earth plant in Texas. The U.S. and Japan are reportedly formulating a plan in case of a crisis over Taiwan. This comes not long after a former Japanese prime minister said that an emergency for Taiwan is an emergency for the U.S.-Japan alliance. NTD's Don Ma has more. The U.S. and Japan have come up with a draft of a contingency plan in case China invades Taiwan. That's according to Japan's Kyoto News, citing Japanese government sources. The news outlet says the plan involves the U.S. Marine Corps setting up temporary attack bases on Japanese islands. 
These bases will be situated on the Ryukyu Island chain. The island chain stretches from Japan to Taiwan. The U.S. bases will tackle the initial stages of a Taiwan crisis by deploying troops, and the Japanese self-defense forces will give logistical support, such as providing ammunition and fuel supplies. The news outlet says that Japan and the U.S. will formalize an operation plan in January next year. This news comes not long after a former Japanese prime minister said that the U.S. and Japan need to take a potential invasion of Taiwan seriously. There is no question that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would impose a significant risk to the land of Japan, both geographically and spatially. A Taiwan emergency is a Japanese emergency, and therefore an emergency for the Japan-U.S. alliance. Japanese Kyoto News explains under what conditions the U.S. military will set up bases. They say it will happen if the Japanese government determines that a conflict between China and Taiwan would threaten Japanese security. If Japan determines there is a security threat, the U.S. military would deploy artillery rocket systems to a temporary base location. Earlier this year, U.S. President Biden and the Japanese Prime Minister at the time issued a joint statement. They underscored the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Don Ma, NTD News. Believe it or not, 2021's most visited website, TikTok. Cloudflare says TikTok was in seventh place in late 2020, but has since skyrocketed upwards. TikTok is a social media app you can use to make short videos. It's owned by a Chinese company called ByteDance. That's raised concerns about national security. The Trump administration tried to ban it. Second and third place went to Google and Facebook, followed by Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, YouTube and Twitter. Shares of Chinese e-commerce site JD.com plummeted today after its largest shareholder, Tencent, said it will give away most of its stake. It raises questions about Tencent's plans for other holdings. NTD's Cheney Wu has the details. Shares of Chinese e-commerce site JD.com plunged as much as 11 percent today in Hong Kong, before closing down 7 percent one of its biggest daily drops since it debuted in the city last year. Meanwhile, its biggest shareholder Tencent stock rose 4 percent. This comes after Tencent said Thursday it'll transfer about $16.4 billion worth of its JD.com stake to shareholders. It slashed Tencent's holding in JD.com from around 17 percent to 2.3 percent now. I think it's a smart idea to give those wealth back to its shareholders so you become not so big of a target. It's probably going to accelerate its investing activities, you know, in other companies. So it won't be, just won't be uh, too prominent in the eyes of Chinese government. Recently, Beijing's been clamping down on tech firms, trying to control their growth overseas and their market power domestically. Local authorities Thursday summoned five online platforms, including Alibaba Group's Taobao, Pinduoduo and JD.com over live streaming irregularities during the Singles Day shopping festival, according to state-owned media. Business professor and Chinese expert Frank Xie says right now China's economy is crumbling, and this is one way for the regime to bring in more revenue. You know, grab money from private sectors, companies like Tencent and others. After Tencent reduced its stake, now Walmart is JD.com's biggest shareholder, owning a 9.3 percent stake. Xie warns that investors need to rethink their investment in big Chinese companies. The American companies of American public or investors should be really uh, careful about uh, the Chinese economy and uh, really consider some uh, exit strategies now. JD.com said the two companies would continue to keep their strategic partnership agreement, though Tencent executive director and President Martin Lau will step down from JD.com's board immediately. Chenny Wu, NTD News. As supply bottlenecks leave businesses struggling to get supplies, we follow one Chinese-made computer game controller from the production line to a warehouse in the U.S. And it proves no easy journey, NTD's Chenny Wu reports. The news is full of stories about supply bottlenecks, about how firms can't get goods from production lines to store shelves. We followed one Chinese export to see what that really means. These game controllers start life in a factory in China's Guangdong province. From there, they go onto ships headed for the United States' final destination, 
Big name stores like Best Buy and Walmart. Or at least that's the theory. The reality now is much more complex, with supply chains thrown into chaos in the wake of the pandemic. Fraser Townley owns manufacturer T2M. It's impossible to get containers, and once you've got the containers, it's impossible to get the drivers, and once you've got the drivers, it's impossible to get things scheduled and timed and, and what have you. So logistics has been um, something we've never experienced before. Like countless Western firms, T2M doesn't have its own factory. Production is done by a Chinese firm. But now it's hard to get goods into the U.S. even if you can get them out of China. Labor shortages mean a record number of container ships are stacked up, waiting to unload outside U.S. ports like Long Beach in California. The problems have driven a surge in costs. This time last year, I remember being extremely upset that I was being charged somewhere between three and a half thousand dollars for a 40-foot container to get here. Um, now, uh, if they ask you for 20,000, you ask where, where do I sign, where do I pay? Uh, it's, it's crazy. The problem is repeated worldwide and firms have been forced to innovate. T2M used to ship goods directly to its warehouse near Boston, Massachusetts. Now they have to go overland from California, a more expensive route. All these problems add to costs and are a big factor behind soaring consumer prices worldwide. Now the White House has a task force looking at ways to ease the logjam. Like firms everywhere, T2M just hopes its products get to the shops in time for the holidays. Chenny Wu, NTD News. A perfectly preserved baby dinosaur has been discovered in Ganzhou in southern China, curled up inside an egg. The 70-million-year-old fossil preserved the embryonic skeleton of a bird-like dinosaur. It's been nicknamed Baby Yingliang, after the name of the Chinese museum which houses the fossil. Experts say baby dinosaur bones are small and fragile and are only very rarely preserved as fossils. So that makes it a very lucky find. The egg is about 7 inches long. The dinosaur is estimated to be 11 inches long from head to tail. Researchers believe as an adult, had it lived, it would have been between 4 and 6 feet long. And just before you go, the entire China in Focus team wishes you a very Merry Christmas. Our newsletters will be off this week and next week, but will return to your inbox in the new year. May your holidays sparkle with joy. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you next time.